A very good morning to one and all present. On behalf of Amity Institute of International Studies, Uttar Pradesh, I, Roshni Ghosh, welcome you to the day of 2021. Global speak, Power Dynamics. Speak, speak a bit slow. Today, speak slowly, please. Slowly. Okay. Today, we will commence with the second technical economic and social. I am session. Mr. is currently a professor of economics at Christ Dean to be University, Ghaziabad. Formerly, she was the director of Amity School of Economics, associate dean at IILM Academy of Higher Learning, head of the department at GNITCM, among others. Professor Sharma has also been an active member of the active academic board of School of Business Studies, Sharda University. Some of her recent published works include a poll exploration around constraining factors of women entrepreneurship, a step towards women empowerment, opportunity costs and commercial real estate, Noida and Mo, and impact of e-commerce on India's exports and investment. She has contributed significantly to interna international journals and conferences and has also been awarded AICTE full travel grant for presenting three papers in 16 international conference on output uh, input output techniques at Istanbul, July 2007. I also like I would also like to take this opportunity to accord a cordial welcome to the co-chair of the session, Professor Nidhi Basin. Dr. Nidhi Basin is the Associate Professor Department of Commerce at the Delhi School of Economics, University of Delhi. Her research specialization lies in foreign direct investment, international taxation, foreign trade, multinational corporations, international business and emerging markets. She has authored several books, including FDI in India, Policies, Conditions and Procedures, Monetary Banking and Financial Developments in India. Dr. Basin has published articles in national and international journals of repute, including Multinational Business Review, Emerald, Foreign Trade Review, Sage, Vikalpa Sage, Journal of International Trade and Economic Development, Taylor & Francis, Transnational Corporations Review, Taylor & Francis. Dr. Basin has presented numerous papers at national and international conferences. And of course, I would extend my heartiest welcome to the scholars who have joined us today. Dr. Mohan Singh, Assistant Professor, Indian Military Academy, Dehradun, India. Doc, Mr. Gaurav Supa and Ms. Prabhesika Pradhan, Research Scholars, Amity University, UP, India. Ms. Devina Singh, Research Scholar, Amity University, Noida, UP, India. Ms. Himashri Sarma, Research Scholar, School of International Studies, JNU, New Delhi, India. Mr. Detun Zang, Research Scholar, Institute for Area Studies, Leiden University, Netherlands, Ms. Monica Setu Raman, PhD scholar, Central China Normal University, Wuhan, PRC. We are extremely glad to witness your present today, presence today. Now, without further ado, Professor Sharani Sharma, Ma, I would kindly like to take the session forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Roshni. And I'm highly grateful to Honorable Founder President, Honorable Chancellor, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Nadia our respected Dr. Nagalakshmi Ma, and the whole team of Amity University for organizing such a brilliant conference, especially the theme is so much pertinent in today's in, uh, world. And I'm so much thankful and uh, for our co-chair, Dr. Niti, to be there with us today. Uh, I'll just give a small brief write-up, which I actually prepared yesterday till one o'clock. And it was so brilliant that I was amazed with the uh, thought processes which we are having these days. And the brilliant thought of Dr. Nagar Lakshmi to have such a uh, brilliant topic for the international conference and moreover for the session today, delineating global power dynamics in Asia Pacific. So we all know that Asia Pacific region comprises a collection of countries located in or near the Western Pacific Ocean. By area, of course, China is the largest country in the region, followed by Australia, India, Indonesia, and Mongolia. Over the last 20 years, the Asia Pacific region has continued to keep high economic growth rates, exceeding those in other regions, and has consequently come to be known as the growth center of the global economy. And you know, this is because of this growth center that there is so much power dynamics happening here. 
and recently we are seeing so much uh, uh, aggressiveness of china over the years it is expected to continue to enjoy the highest growth rates in the world and to serve as the engine of a world economy the region is characterized by stronger economic growth than any other a rich diversity of both socio economic and natural environment an abundance of natural resources including tropical rainforests and marine products in recent years these have been joined as salient features of a new wave of economic growth centered around the hunan economic sphere a quickening of intra regional trade and rise in intra regional interdependence the countries of the region are at various levels of economic growth while australia japan republic of korea new zealand and singapore are characterized as highly industrialized countries bangladesh cambodia china india pakistan and vietnam are regarded as low income countries in the east asian growth economies outward looking policies of trade liberalization and relaxation of restrictions on foreign capital are stimulating trade and investment activities and powering export oriented growth in a sequence beginning with the nies that is the newly industrialized economies and continuing with the asean members and china in that order countries which got late economic starts are catching up with those ahead of them and in the process the later are finding it necessary to restructure their industries but there is a power politics being played by china the way china has gained the doing business ranking is not surprising capture of countries such as pakistan or multilateral organizations like world health organization is far for the course as far as the ruthless principles and related actions of the chinese communist party china sees every global engagement as part of a war effort although the physical contours of the war are around pulling nations in the south china sea or an eyeball to eyeball stalemate with india its real war is outside in several realms one of which is the capture of multilateral institutions and we all know that this war is now moving towards us beijing has far greater military resources to bring to bear on its relations with its neighbors increasing pressure on taiwan's defenses by the chinese people's liberation army has many in washington and tokyo worried about beijing's intentions japan will have no choice but to prepare to defend itself in the case of a conflict across the taiwan strait proximity to taiwan only 100 or so kilometers separate taiwan from japan's southernmost islands makes the possibility of conflict there of deep interest to japan's self defense forces in addition okinawa hosts a considerable array of us military forces making it a likely staging area for uh, any us assistance to taiwan's defenses japanese deputy prime minister taro aso testified to the diet on 5th july that a military crisis across the taiwan strait would threaten japan's survival this was a nod to the 2015 security laws that laid the groundwork for the stf to join with other national militaries in case of a conflict second china pakistan new nuclear deal on september 18 may push world towards renewed arms race and conflict the agreement envisage the transfer of nuclear technology uranium mining and processing nuclear fuel supply and setting up research reactors which will help pakistan increase its nuclear weapons stockpile for china an enhanced pakistan nuclear arsenal adds teeth to its grand strategy of countering india's military strength third 
In less than six months, the quadrilateral, that's the Japan, US, India, Australia security dialogue, the Quad is back in action. After its virtual summit in March on 24th, Friday, that is September, we will see the leaders of four major Indo-Pacific nations converge in Washington to deliberate on matters of common concern and also to signal to China that the platform that Beijing once described as C4 is not only not dissipating, but also gearing up to play a more ambitious role. If the March summit was about laying out an extensive agenda for a still nascent grouping, the September summit is likely to be about operationalizing the common vision of the four like-minded democracies as they chart their policy priorities in an ever so turbulent Indo-Pacific region. Now, ahead of the Quad Summit, now we all know that the Quad Summit is taking place tomorrow. The leaders of the Quad nations have decided to concentrate on creating a safe supply chain for semiconductors. This implies that the Quad nations are looking forward to expanding their scope against the manufacturing giant, China, in the Indo-Pacific. Focusing on technological development, the four-nation framework may soon confirm resilient, diverse, and secure technology supply chains for hardware and software that are of utmost importance to their national interest. The latest developments are largely favorable from an Indian viewpoint. Fourth, the announcement of a new security partnership, that is Australia, UK, US, which will enable Australia to equip its Navy with nuclear propelled attack submarines is a clear signal to China, as well as the American allies in Asia, that Washington is determined about stepping up to meet Beijing's challenge in the Indo-Pacific region. Last and the fifth point, India and Russia are set to sign a bilateral military logistics agreement in the coming months. The India-Russia bilateral agreement is called the Reciprocal Exchange of Logistics Agreement, similar in title to an India-US agreement called the Logistics Exchange Memorandum of Agreement. Like all logistics service agreements, the RELOS is meant to be a reciprocal arrangement by which the two nations can use the military logistics facilitates while on visit to each other's ports, bases, and military installations. While the current churn in the Indo-Pacific may have begun with Chinese actions, it is now other regional players that are willing to set new terms of engagement with Beijing. These terms are both political and economic in nature. I now open the house for discussion with the presentation of papers. And I also request uh, all the speakers to have 10 minutes for presentations and five minutes for discussions. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Niti Basin, would you be, uh, would you like to speak a few words, please? Uh, Dr. Niti Basin will be joining in another 10 minutes, ma'am, uh, because she has got some urgent call in her office. Okay. So she just messaged me that she'll be joining in another 10, 15, maximum 10, Perfect. 15 minutes. Perfect. So then so we can open continue. the house for yes. discussion. Yes. Yes, ma'am. We open the Thank house you. for discussions and paper presentations. May I request Dr. Mohan Singh to please start with his presentation. And do we have any volunteers keeping the time, please? So the volunteers will be putting in the chat group, in the chat that the time is coming to an end. So at eight minutes, when you are there, the, they'll, you'll get one tap that the two minutes are left. And then we'll request you to wind up in uh, two minutes. Uh, Roshni, Dr. you should Mohan. do this. 
Roshni? Yes, sir. I'm on it. Fine, fine. Dr. Mohan, may we have your presentation, please? Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for giving this opportunity. I uh, will start with this uh, uh, that I am very much thankful to this organizer and especially uh, Dr. Dipya, ma'am. Uh, actually, I am not from the basically this uh, academics world, but fortunately, we come across. I am uh, a assistant professor in Indian Military Academy, Dehradun. We used to teach the GC cadets and Fortunately, we have to uh, do some uh, academic things also. So I tried my best to uh, find a bridge between the economics and the uh, the current uh, topic related to the world power balancing and the international relation. And I. If anyone want to share that PPT, just let us know. We will uh, give you the yes. rights to share. This. Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, they have PPT. I. Uh, IT team, uh, kindly give permission. Uh, give the uh, permission to share the screen to Dr. Mohan Singh. Sir, please share your screen. Dr. Mohan Singh, it's now yeah. open. You can share the screen. Share this team. Okay. Yeah. Is it visible? Okay. So uh, basically, the all economic orders, uh, so reward orders. Uh, is basically dependent on the economic orders and economic development is a kind of integrated process which cannot be seen in isolation and the outcome may be uh, the uh, political uh, uh, development and political uh, power balancing but this power balancing sometimes help in the economic uh, powers gaining and balancing as well. So what uh, do I feel that economic development when it goes in its own course, it is the uh, uh, the its a very nature is to expand it, and more expansion of the economic activity is the out outcome and the fuel for the economic activity to uh, grow further. So basically, economic activity is a uh, kind of uh, uh, means when we try to find out the uh, we, we talk about the economies of scale and we talk about the uh, benefit from the economic activity in collective so expansion of market becomes very important and the very outcome of this activity the intention of expansion of market is the uh, intention of uh, creating a global kind of society where the uh, economic power balancing economic tools political tools of course are used to gain the benefit and retain the benefit more and more in their uh, every country's favor so the modern, uh, uh, the global globalized village concept is basically, in my opinion, is the outcome of the basic economic nature, basic nature of economic activity of human being. So more uh, larger extent of market, more benefit, and more benefit is again in the favor of extending the market. Now, uh, my topic is basically related uh, the uh, case study of uh, Asia-Pacific Trade Agreement, which is a kind of regional trade agreement. The, uh, it has come in line that, uh, recently that there was a debate on that issue that in the time of globalization, where all the countries are uh, coming together, what is the need and relevance of uh, creating such localized kind of agreements or uh, the uh, you can say pressure group and uh, how far it is helpful uh, for India to be to give this importance to that. This is economic uh, economic agreement economic uh, you can say 
curtailed, but at the same time, it is going to be uh, somehow going to give the benefit for our country in terms of the uh, strategic or the political uh, position, positioning in our region as well as in international uh, arena. So just for the uh, introduction of this agreement, it is large initiated uh, in 1975 by five members initially. Later on, China and Korea joined this. Uh, the data was renamed again as Asia Pacific Trade Agreement in 2005. There are so many uh, agreements and negotiations take place. And the United Nations Working Group on the Investment Services and Trade Facilitation, they work as the, uh, the under the aegis of this organization. This agreement is working. And the main objective of APTA, that is agreement, uh, to help the participating countries for their uh, facilitating in terms of reducing the barriers, tariffs basically, and also to motivate the cross-border investment so that the, the collective, collective uh, development process can be speed up and uh, the benefit can be shared by the participating country. Now the structure of the agreement is, it is open to all members, but till now we have the seven members, including India. India is the, uh, you can say, member since 1975. Now, Korea, China, and these are the other members. This agreement not only covers the conventional tariff, I told you, that it is also to assist the countries to reduce the trade of services and other non-tariff barriers, which may be in the hurdle of the free trade between the among these countries, and also to promote the investment in uh, other countries. There are three main st uh, structural bodies, Ministerial Council, Standing Committee, and Secretariat, as we can see in detail in the paper. Now, India being the uh, oldest member of this agreement, now I just uh, referred that Recently, after uh, 2016, this agreement has come in limelight. I, the government started giving more stress upon this to revival of this uh, agreement. Uh, India has given uh, more than 2,000 uh, items are uh, included in the agreement for that the relaxation on the tariff is given for the participating country, membering countries. Now, if we uh, see what is the relevance and what India can get benefit of it, we have to uh, we have to see the development or progress of this uh, agreement in reference to India. Uh, for that, I have taken four kind of data. One, India is export to the uh, other countries of this agreement. Now, India is import from these countries. Now, the total uh, India's trade in position of the world trade, and now how this trade has progressed uh, since its inception. Especially I've taken data from 2004-05 only when this uh, was renamed as Asia Pacific Trade Agreement. If you see the data, the, the chart shows that the trade, total trade, which was around 4 billion, three, uh, four, more than 4 billion, it increased to more than 23 billion in these 15, 16 years. So this is the progress of this trade agreement. Export, India's export to these countries. Now India's export is also increased. You can say export uh, as compared to export, import is increased much more faster as from 4 billion to 58 billion, around more than 58 billion. That is the many, uh, much many uh, more times as compared to the export to these countries. Now, this data, since it is presented in percentage, it will be more clear for all of us to see that how export and import, changes in export and import taken place year to year. Now, uh, 2004-05, as, uh, as compared to the, this data as percentage of share means, percentage of India's total export to world trade and to these APTA countries. So
so that india's trade was 11% total export uh, 11% of the total export india's export was to these countries in 2004 5 mm. now there is a change in uh, a slight change in this percentage but still it is one tenth around one tenth of the total india's world export where in case of import as in the previous slide showing in case of import in 2004 5 the share of india's import from these countries as compared to the total import was 9.9 percent which increased to 17.48 percent in 2019-20 so this way the share and now you can see as on present india's import from apta countries is almost at 17.5 uh, percent which is very uh, um, the significant size as compared to the total of board of our country it is because of the Chinese uh, inclusion in the agreement where we are importing more of the things uh, from China as compared to the previous condition. And therefore, our total import bill as compared to the import of our country in uh, reference to this, you know, this agreement, uh, uh, country participating in this agreement, it is increased. Now, if you see India trade growth with the Asia Pacific trade agreement countries, the growth trajectory also saying that uh, although in 1920, the uh, growth is negative because of the so many uh, problems worldwide, the uh, intercross border trade was not taking place that much. We can see the growth of export increasing year to year basis 2015, 16, 16, 17, 17, 18, 18, 19, and 1920. For five years, we can see it is increasing till 18, 19. India's total growth uh, export is increasing, and India's export to the these countries is also increasing, but it is always more than the India's total export to other countries. So it is very clear that uh, these countries are going to be our uh, greater export partners, means trade partners, and therefore. We uh, should try to be uh, positive. We should try to be positive in the sense that this uh, trade agreement can be a kind of a strategic and uh, economic trade uh, agreement which can help India project and in long run as well. If you see the uh, percentage growth of import year to year basis, then we see the export of our country increasing, but export to these countries. Uh, especially after 1718, it is not that much significant. If we can leave uh, the year 1920 because of the uh, special kind of uh, this financier, then also we can say that our import is increased, total import is increased, but import from this country as in comparison to the other uh, countries of the world is not that much significant increase. Maybe because of some uh, 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 can say monetary issues, but this data overall uh, represent us and give us in that uh, the strategic trade partnership like this, uh, inclusive of the a small uh, group, this can be a very uh, good thing for India because we are sharing uh, similar kind of uh, culture. We are sharing almost similar kind of uh, terrain and this, uh, other conditions. So markets are easily understandable for the other countries. The cost of transportation or other economic benefits are also there that can be converted into the economic dividend for mutual benefit of the trade. So uh, I uh, want to uh, put forward two points. That first one is this kind of agreement. We can take example of this uh, Asia Pacific trade agreement, which is a localized uh, trade agreement serve for the benefit of economic dividend of participating countries in terms of low cost trade and in terms of the uh, you can say uh, collective effort to uh, uh, to to catalyze the benefit of economic dividend division of labor and uh, all this benefit we can uh, observe at the same time this will also provide opportunity for our country to 
to uh, develop such a kind of pressure group or you can say a kind of a strong localized uh, localized collision that can be uh, that can be used for india in uh, in uh, other front as well when we are dealing with the rest of world where the other dominating countries are in an, uh, are in position to precise and get their uh, things turned into their favor so the second question which come across that whether this kind of group where maybe this uh, asia pacific trade agreement or sarc for that matter nowadays it is very uh, much in limelight so this kind of localized group serve the purpose of our country to uh, be a, in the globalized era as a leader for the uh, other countries and set up his its position second thing whether it is not harming the international structure where any country can be close to any country in terms of the uh, policies or the economic uh, benefits or a kind of strategic partnership so my submission is that this kind of agreement first of all because of this they are sharing similar kind of situations economic uh, natural and uh, political situation almost similar so they are matlab is very uh, you can say positive chance to come together easily can understand each other easily and then they can get the uh, uh, benefit uh, shared by each uh, each participating member easily so therefore that means there is a fair chance to for this small or group to come closer easily and fastly and therefore the integrated economic uh, kind of thing is going to help economic benefit as well as the strategic benefit second thing that internet uh, this kind of a smaller group localized group or regional group doesn't come in the way of the international international uh, international structure or economic uh, structure because that regional groups are somehow if we are able to uh, produce and sell at lower cost to the other countries so other countries out of this uh, trade agreements may also be benefited in linking there if they are able to do so with one country they will be uh, having the access of others market as well so international integration is not hampered by the localized or regional integration and therefore we should not think behind but we should look forward to uh, support and uh, you can say support and strengthen this kind of organization not only from the economics point of view but also the from point of view of strategy and the other political and uh, international relations so i hope government is thinking like this only and therefore there are a number of things taking place nowadays so that ki this agreement is going to be helpful for all of us sorry i think not taking much time sir we yeah we need to wind up now i was just oh, about oh, to say oh, that oh, oh. thank you very much sona sir actually i initially i told it is my just a, yep. a kind of uh, this uh, review kind of uh, research we are not front line researchers so generally it is difficult for us to go in that much of the technical detailing uh, thank you for uh, sharing this stage uh, to uh, uh, to deliver my thought and if there is anything thank you dr mohan singh it was a wonderful presentation and we learned a lot if you have any questions regarding the same may i request anybody from the audience to unmute yourself and ask the question yeah hello my students in, yeah yes, students um, are not given option to unmute they can give uh, they can post so they can put it in the chat box perfect so if there yeah. are any questions please post it in the chat box so that we can uh, request dr mohan to enlighten us with the same over 67 65 
आई थिंक आई थिंक वी कैन गो हेड वी कैन एड्रेस दी क्वेश्चन इन द एंड मैम आई थिंक इट इज प्रधान Yes, yes. Can we have the presentation, please? Uh, Will you be yes. presenting with your slides? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, please go ahead. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Please click on share screen button. There is a green a green button. Uh, yes, sir. Green share screen button. When you click on share screen button, uh, you can find your open already open PPT. Click on that. Uh, Meanwhile, I request the third uh, presenter. Miss Devi Devina Singh to be ready with her presentation. Otherwise, we'll be losing a lot of time in this process. Please, all the presenters, please be ready. We are following the same uh, uh, system as we uh, the your name as your names are listed in the uh, right. So, please uh, after this, we have Devina Singh. Please, you be ready with your presentation, please. Gorov, please make it uh, full screen slide show mode. Okay. Sir. Is it visible? My screen is yes, visible, visible, right? Yes, yes. Please, please go ahead. Okay. Respected chair, uh, ma'am. Uh, respected co-chair, professors, uh, faculties, uh, uh, panelists, and uh, the participants and attendees. Attendees. Good morning to you all. And uh, today's topic uh, on this seminar is we are having analyzing insecurity complexes between India and Pakistan. And this paper will be presented. by two uh, of us and uh, me myself is uh, gaurav subha and the other one is prabhisika pradhan and she will be covering the second half of this uh, ppt parameters that we are uh, looking in uh, highlighting will be highlighting a strategy counter and in india obsession with kashmir legacy of territorial dispute and Uh, water resources economic relation pakistan factor india's political relations with pakistan china prism diplomatic support afghanistan issues indian concerns and yes china's kashmir policy so uh, the main uh, 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 theme of this paper is that what are the parameters for the insecurity complex uh, complexes uh, of relationship between Pakistan and India. The paper examines how Pakistan perceives India and vice versa. This paper more important tries to understand and focus on what are the parameters for the insecurity complex in the relationship between Pakistan and India. And in order to analyze this paper, we have used secondary sources like journal articles, book, newspaper, digital or electronic sources, and have used interpretive method as to why the certain parameters has caused insecurity between the two or mistrust between India and Pakistan. and uh, in uh, the first is that it is rather strange even after acquiring nuclear weapons as a deterrent to any probable all out indian attacks pakistan continues to play by a sense of insecurity repeated indian assurances to the contrary have failed to convince pakistan that india is reconciled to pakistan's sovereign existence and would not pose any physical threat to it unless provoked um pakistan has rather continued with its strategy of bleeding india through cross border subversion it has raised a constituency of armed non state actors for example like laskar e taiba jaisi mohammad uh, harkat ul mujahideen hizbul mujahideen etc to spread terror in india by all possible means the most effective of them uh, laskar e taiba has been gone to the extent of asserting itself as the only uh, true and usable nuclear bomb that pakistan has in its arsenal even when pakistan has been compelled to pacifist through dialogue with india under pressure from outside it has kept this option open and and as investigations into the serial bomb blast in it, india during 
2007 and the Mumbai carnage in November 2008 invariably reveal Pakistan continues to use terror as an instrument of its policy towards India, even when there is enough evidence to uh, prove that such policy has started affecting its own internal security. And uh, when we look at the strategy counter India, uh, it has also launched several armed uh, operations against India's operations like uh, operations like uh, Gulmark 1947, Venus 1948, Gibraltar and Grand Slam 1965 and Badr 1999, and consciously denied involvement of the Pakistani state in any of them. However, memoirs of the Pakistani officials, both civilians and military, clearly indicate that the Pakistani state had planned and imp implemented those options to seize control of the Kashmir Barry and inflict a conclusive defeat on the Indian Army. Even after successive defeats at the hands of the Indian Army, its sense of belligerence is driven by the basic assumptions which led Ayub to war in 1965, uh, which is a past case, as we all know. And as a general Hindu rule, moral would not stand more than a couple books delivered at the right time and place. Such openness should therefore be sought and exploited. Because uh, the past experiences do uh, affect the relationship, uh, the current relationship between the countries. Mm. And uh, it was Pakistan's concerns that the Kashmiris might spawn its uh, non-committal over the issue during the late 1940s. India stands in only when Pakistan, Pakistan's unjustified demands were accorded uh, precedence over Indian concerns by external mediators. Pakistan's refusal to withdraw its troops from the territory under its control basically killed the UN resolutions for plebiscite. Kashmir's went on to affirm the, affirm the faith in the Indian constitution and adopted democracy in early 1950s. Pakistan continued to interfere with the democratic administration of the state and took a due advantage of political turmoil within the state to strengthen militancy during, during the mid 1960s and the 1990s. Now looking at the legacy of territorial dispute, after three wars over the territory for the past two decades and renowned uprising, the conflict has left 70,000 70, dead and more, and the migration of more than two, uh, two, 20 uh, black Kashmiri Hindus from the uh, Bali. Another legacy of the painful participant, uh, partisan contributing to the durability of conflict is the in irreconcilable positions on our national identity when Pakistan, as the home of the Muslims in the continent, repeated itself from the secular, uh, multicultural, multi-religious India based on the two-nation theory. Potential elements of transportation exist, however, within Pakistan become increasingly unable to claim its leadership position from the Ummah further analyzed below. Indians, India is also increasingly the challenge by the Asian politics, its own Hindu parties led by BJP, which confront the modernist Congress party, which currently we can, you know, try to link with the Taliban, Afghanistan, and uh, Pakistan, and of course, India. These shifts, although transforming the nature of domestic politics, do not, however, diminish from the continuation of identity-based conflicts between the two states. Uh, regarding water resources, though they really, you know, uh, not much of a topic, but these things are still uh, uh, working as an element to, you know, rupture the relation between the two countries. And and yes, uh, these things cannot be ignored. The original idea uh, was to treat water development as a common project that was functional and not political in nature, and to force an example of for Indo-Pakistani cooperation. However, political, political impediments have often preceded technical debates. Pakistan regularly accuses India, the upper repairing state in the Indus River system of suppressing the flow of water downstream to Pakistan. India plans of constructing of hydroelectric projects on the river in the Kishan Ganga and in the tributary and the completion of the Baglihar Dam on the Chenab River in 2008. 
are seen by Pakistan as threats to the irrigation and electricity plans of Pakistan and violation of the uh, Indus Water Treaty. Uh, the, the water crisis in Pakistan is directly linked to relations between India as to uh, the uh, thoughts of the Pakistani side. When we look at the um, uh, uh, economic relations, uh, we see that the rising debt and economy of uh, Pakistan could in principle find uh, solutions in more trade with the immediate neighbor, uh, especially as economic growth in India occurs in, <coughs> excuse me, in new possibilities for investments into the subcontinent. India's economic growth, for example, could be a pull factor for economic migrants, including Pakistani ones as well, who contribute to the GDP through considerable remittances. International reconstruction efforts in Afghanistan also have provided new impetus for economic cooperation with the possibility for engagement of Pakistani manpower in the infrastructure projects funded by India uh, or of Pakistani company, uh, companies for procurement. Yet political conflict and mistrust between the two countries to thwart economic opportunities. Not only do the two countries trade more with other than with other, but Pakistan had also until 2010 blocked access of India to the Afghan uh, Transit Agreement, or, uh, ATA, under the pressure of the religious and traditional security sectors of its establishment. More so ever, uh, the current uh, crisis in Afghanistan is going to impact a lot in uh, the relationship between China, India, and Pakistan. In the economic sphere, India's proactive position stands against Pakistan's defensive and conservative one, despite the objective opportunities that increased trade could specifically bring to Pakistan. Pakistan does not allow India to use the land route for trading with Pakistan, arguing that technical and strategic is connected to transit trade should be resolved first. But whereas when we see the pandemic cases, uh, the, we should not be bothered about the you know far distance of our countries or uh, the partners because uh, when uh, someone from a neighbor is affected by uh, you know this pandemic the immediate impact will be the to the closer ones so we should try to look at these options uh, pakistani factor the terror industry and proxy war by Pakistan notwithstanding their economic difficulties, which have uh, pop, uh, which have uh, which continuously pops up in the news. Whenever they are on the verge of sinking, some country will bail them out to foster its own interest to them because of their strategic location or terror potential. As the security situation unfolds in Afghanistan, Pakistan region, we should not be surprised if Taliban which was decimated by the multinational forces once, but not just by Pakistan, maybe in the driver's seat in the power struggle in Afghanistan, acknowledging Pakistan as one of the main brokers. I, when we look at India's political relations with Pakistan, though we, India and Pakistan have tried to uh, mend the relationship through various uh, actions, but uh, at the back door, uh, back door, there is always a uh, mistrust between the two countries. Like the two South Asian regional powers, India and Pakistan remains a strategic rivals competing for regional influence and engage in contradictory and counterproductive acts. There exists a serious political security conflict between the two South Asian rivals, which pose a hindrance to maintaining close relations for their mutual benefits. And when we look through the prism of uh, China, uh, uh, we see that when we go back that until the late 1950s, Pakistan's relation with China had not entered a takeoff stage. However, October 1962, Pakistan was driven closer to paging the Sino-Indian War or what is said into Sino-Pakistan relations with a view to winning Chinese favors. The Pakistani press even started blaming India for the confrontations. Pakistan on the Burger Agreement 2nd March 1960 ceded a portion of Azad Kashmir to uh, China. India though protested to both China and pa Pakistan stating its position that it not agree to any arrangement or agreements on Indian territory which was under illegal occupation of Pakistan. The Indian government alleged that Pakistan had not given away 2050 square miles but 11,000 square miles of territory the data of the survey of Pakistan. This agreement signifies 
serious strategic implications for India and had China to have direct access and attack capability of Kashmir by land via the Karakoram Pass and by air via direct Chinese air link to the Jinjit airfield, thereby re reinforcing the morale of Pakistan. Also, um, an official nuclear cooperation agreement signed between the two countries in 1986. It is the agreement that forms the close relationship of nuclear technology transfer between China and Pakistan. This cooperation reads on its peaks in the 1990s when assisted Pakistan in building its nuclear, cap uh, nuclear capabilities, where it is a serious threat to the South Asian countries when it comes to security, and when especially a country like India uh, promotes uh, disarmament. In, when we see diplomatic support uh, during the post 9-11 period, when the United States declared several organizations and international terrorist groups, Pakistani organizations, Laska Itoiba, Jamat Ud, the war were also among them. First time in April 2006, United States brought a bid in UN Security Council declared JUM and LET as international terrorist groups. But China used its veto power and blocked bids on Pakistan requests. Later again, in May 2007, China blocked Indian US proposal in United Nations Security Council for putting sanctions on Pakistani led organization. Please request you to please wind up. Please wind up. 10 minutes are over. Please okay. hurry up. Thank you. So, uh, China always proved that it is time tested all with a friend of Pakistan and extend its umbrella to save Pakistan for international community pressure. Uh, the factors of Sino Pakistan all with the friendship it views as an impediment in India's defense landscape coupled with China's Chinese assertiveness, Chinese activities in Pakistan pose serious threats to India's Indian security interests. The Indian factor in Sino-Pakistan best explained by Hussein Nakhan, former Pakistan, to the United States. He states that for Pakistan, Chinese, China is a high value guarantor of security against India. Additionally, for China, Pakistan is a low cost secondary return to India. So looking at Afghanistan issues, Pakistan's only ambitions in Afghanistan is achieving its long cherished goal for strategic depth which is in sharp contrast to India's uh, interest of ensuring lasting stable security in Pakistan. Pakistan wants to see an upper puppet regime such as Taliban regime in Afghanistan that would work according to their interest, which might be uh, you know, quite uh, uh, confusing in today's uh, current affairs. Pakistan believes that if India continues to expand its influence in Afghanistan, then it would derail its prospect of gaining strategic depth in Afghanistan Strategic depth in Afghanistan would give Pakistan an edge to deter India from two fronts. Also, it would seek to use the state of Afghanistan as launching and training pad for terrorism. So from here on, I hand over the mic and the floor to Ms. Prabhisika Pradhan. So after uh, there is a position in security in like, uh, currently because the Taliban effectively sealed their control over Afghanistan, pouring down into the Kabul, and the government collapsed. Now the dynamics changes out here because uh, moreover, like uh, the return of Taliban to power not only bodies ill of ordinary Afghan pop population, but also threatens the regional and international security architecture. I'll repeat the regional and international security arch architecture are threatened. The sole purpose of the United States uh, uh, invasion in Afghanistan was to destroy the terrorist infrastructure that prevailed under the ta Taliban regime and to restore the human rights that, uh, that the organization had destroyed in Afghanistan. Um, further, uh, I want to point out that the, the return of Taliban has raised speculation that Afghanistan will once again become the nexus of global terrorist organization. The previous Taliban regime harbored Al-Qaeda operatives who planned and executed various terror attacks <coughs> on Afghan soil, including 9-11 attacks. The, this, be, and this became the primary reason for the uh, American intervention to uproot the Taliban and its allies, who posed a major security challenge for the United States. However, the withdrawal of America and allied troops and the Taliban res re resurgence, Afghanistan may well become a prime real estate for terrorist group willing to pay for tra training grounds in the failed state. Now, the most important thing that I want to showcase is that one 
the report of UN uh, Office of Drug and Crime in 2020, there was a 37% increase of opium cultivation in Afghanistan. The Taliban had previously used drug as a major revenue model, trafficking, uh, making trafficking and major part of organization economy. As I, as I can say that Taliban uh, is totally based on drug-based economy. When Taliban's, with the Taliban's lack of effective understanding of public administration and policy, the organization had always countered or uh, count on drugs as its fund for its objectives. As per the uh, official report, Taliban earned more than US dollar 40 million between 2018 to 2019 from drug trade, according to a special ins inspector general for Afghanistan Re reconstruction report. The United United States spent an estimate of uh, US dollar 8.6 billion between 2002 to 2017 to approve drug trade and crush the Taliban financing. But Afghanistan being a landlocked country and it is heavily dependent upon a various border passes like Zaran in Afghan Iranian border for the transit of goods. The control of these border crossing points with Tajikistan in the north, Iran in the west, and Pakistan in the south allows the Taliban to traffic drugs more easily. With the ever going demand of this illicit products, the coming of a sewer supplier like the Taliban will boost the global drug problem, posing a major challenge to a regional nation and rendering them the epicenter for the drug abuse and peddling. Peddling. Therefore, one could argue that the re resurgence of Taliban will have profound implications for the global drug problem. In the era of globalization, an Afghan narcotic narco state will not only pose a major uh, challenge for region, but also provide a greater supplies to the lucrative markets in Europe and North America, making it major security issues. And I like to wind up this our presentation by saying that with the Taliban reestablishing in the uh, its rule in Afghanistan, the result in non the result in non traditional uh, security issue will pose major concerns. These issues will not only be restricted to illicit drug traf trafficking and resurgence of global terrorism, but also includes human migration as well as uh, trafficking and arms smuggling and more. So. India and the world major political uh, geopolitical power must establish a mechanism to check the rise of these activities for the betterment and the security for all. Thank you. And to conclude in the last, uh, what uh, like we like to we found is that at first we felt like and in the second stage we felt we know something and now we have come to a point where we have realized that we know nothing. So instead of answer we have. You know, uh, we, we, we have, uh, we, we are with questions, we, we are left with questions only like, should we, these parameters be left to the next generations to resolve or to, uh, or is it that we should ignore these parameters and, you know, try to build a better future for the, you know, uh, for the world, including China, Pakistan and relations. Thank you all. Thank you all for listening especially. Thank you very much for the presentation as we do not have much time left for taking any questions. So maybe uh, the question may be posted in the chat box. Uh, may I request the next presenter, Ms. Devina Singh, to uh, start the presentation, please. Is she there? Uh, ma'am, uh, Dr. Shalini, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Niti yes. Basin has joined. So I thought, okay, so may I request uh, Dr. Niti Hello, madam. Basin. Hello, how are you, ma'am? Very well, and very well. Thank yes. you. So, uh, we yeah, yeah, please, please carry on. I guess, I guess we are in the middle of the session. So yeah. please carry on. Yeah. Thank you so much. And welcome again. I, on behalf of all the organizers, in fact, in behalf of Dr. Nagalakshmi also welcome you to the uh, session. And uh, may I now request our next uh, presenter, Ms. Devina Singh, to please start her presentation. Devina. So uh, I believe she's not yeah. there. Miss Miss Himashri Sarna, are you there? Miss Himashri Sarna. Uh, hi, ma'am. I'm here. Am I audible? Okay. I'll yes, you're like audible. Yes, please. Please go ahead. And even your camera. Possible, uh, I'll just uh, switch on the camera and then uh, switch it off so that there is a little bit of bandwidth problem. There might be a lack in my voice. Um, I'm just Perfect. Switching. And I request you to please uh, maintain the time. 
Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Please go ahead. Yes. You may share your screen. I believe you have the presentation rights given to you. Yes. Uh, am, is my screen visible now? Yes, yes, it is. Can you please uh, have us blow your slides, please? Yeah. Yes. Please just blow your a slides. second. Yeah. Before that, I'm just uh, switching off the video and I can come back once the presentation is over so that there is no... Okay, perfect. And uh, please maintain the time again. I'm requesting you. Sure, ma'am. Thank you. Please start. Um, good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank all the organizing committee members of VGG Shu, the res respected panelists and attendees for giving me this opportunity. This is still a study in progress, so please pardon if I missed uh, sharing any important points and please feel free to share your comments, feedbacks, so that I can enhance and make this study better. The topic of my presentation is the dynamics of cultural globalization in Asia Pacific. Uh, before I start, I just want to mention that uh, I think no country takes their fluffy pop music more seriously than South Korea. I'm sure BTS has reached most of our television screens today, um, apart from the music and their huge fa uh, fan base, but also because of their recent status of being the celebrity diplomats who accompanied the Korean president as a special con envoy to the UN General Assembly held a few days back as youth icons and influencers. When Parasite won the Oscars last year and the cast of Minari won several uh, Oscars, uh, Oscars, South Korea definitely grabbed a few eyeballs at the world stage. These, these events might seem recent, but they have definitely been in place as a process for a long time now and have been more accessible due to the process of globalization. This paper is basically an attempt to place the cultural experiences of uh, sorry, it's uh, to place the experiences of cultural globalization in the context of the sociological discourse on Korean wave, also popularly uh, known as Hallyu, and understanding its narrative, which has helped build a distinctive global K brand and has penetrated across the diverse regions of Southeast Asia, Middle East, South America, North America in a very short span of time. So as I start, uh, the 21st century has been predicted by many as the century of the Asia Pacific. The term Asia Pacific suggests an emerging uh, region which is shrouded with several inconsistencies in defining it. it. The paradigm itself presents a shifting special analogy which is constantly in motion. So even when the territorial identity implies it as a union of different nations with geographical fluidities, the nucleus of identity has been those countries in the Northeast and Southeast Asia, comprising of China, Korea, Japan, and the 10 Asian countries. However, the peripheral nations have changed easily and the Pacific part is understood as including the countries of Australia, New Zealand, the smaller Pacific Island states, and Papua New Guinea, along with the inclusion of some parts of United States. Uh, so even though economic development was seen as problematic, the 1960s witnessed a sudden growth being underway in Japan and China, which was followed by a similar process after the third industrial revolution, boosting the uh, economies of the four tiger uh, economies that we call that is Singapore, uh, South Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan. And this was later joined by Malaysia and more recently India. So as we uh, try to understand the development of the Asia Pacific region, different theorists have put forward their perspective. So uh, Asia have historically been the center of world economy and by the 1990s, um, it has actually started regaining its original place after the brief interlude. Uh, there is another narrative which says that it was primarily due to the rise of the information age in the 1970s, that there was a considerable implication on the effects of development and the growing recognition of the region. So the Asia Pacific um, region has been impacted by the global economic, political and cultural relations due to the patterns of globalization that has penetrated through trade relations, technological change, foreign investments, division of labor, et cetera. And all these uh, are seen as external processes that has been pushed by the world powers, especially Europe and US, thereby transforming the Asia Pacific continuum. So as we have uh, talked a lot about what's um, like globalization, cultural globalization, different theorists and sociologists have attempted to put forward a definition of this term which stresses on few important things and is visible across their perspectives. 
like the importance of the local and the global, the annihilation of space, cultural emphasis, and the development of interdependency rather than just interconnectedness. So what we see as globalization today is an intensification of worldwide social relations, which link distant localities in such a way that local happenings are shaped by events occurring many miles away. So um, another uh, popular, um, so as uh, globalization has uh, uh, changed, the multidimensional nature of globalization has also rendered the balance of power among states to become much more dynamic as well as fragile and unpredictable. This is characterized by trends which are overlapping and mutually, uh, and mutually reinforcing to enable cultural uniformity. One of the strength is the process of global interconnectedness of strongest culture, superiority in terms of economic, technology, and military power, which imposes supremacy on what is imposes supremacy on the other weaker nations or communities. And this has led to the creation of a hybrid culture when a powerful nation becomes a trendsetter in terms of lifestyle, pop culture, as it is usually observed among the youth today, and in the field of music, entertainment, fashion, healthcare, leading to the development of a soft power in which the strongest culture imposes itself on the other. Uh, so as we uh, talk about culture, so South Korean culture has grown, grown in prominence to become a major driver of global culture, which is observed in everything from Korean dramas on Netflix to Korean skincare regimes, dominating the cosmetic industry to delicious Korean food, as well as language. So um, now globalization has talked about, uh, has uh, not only brings the focus of, uh, from economic and political significance, but also it has included culture in its global environment. For far too long, United States, US has been the symbol of material and popular culture. And the processes has been actually uh, viewed in terms of the perspective of McDonaldization, coca colonization but it was primarily post the 1997, which, 1997, which has created a new wave of cultural influence with the entry of this Asian culture. So what is this new wave? Popularly known as the K-wave or the Korean wave or Hallyu, it was a term which was coined by the Chinese media around the mid 1999 to describe all things that ever, that, to describe all things that's Korean and which seemed like an overnight explosion. For a majority of the people, uh, when this explosion had happened, the very mention of Korea actually presented a distorted idea of two Koreas, the North and the South, who are engaged in a state of historical war and conflict. However, with the growth and the popularity of the Korean TV dramas, music, movies, fashion, food, and the prominent brands like LG, Samsung, Kia, Hyundai, all of them contributed to the acceleration of building a global Korean wave. So um, in terms of uh, statistics, Hallyu has estimated boost of um, 12.3 billion US dollars to the Korean economy in 2019. And this wave has hit across the glo globe, tracing its origin to the source of import of Korean television dramas. Uh, broadly, uh, if I have to trace, there are three political events which helps in identifying the cultural identity of the nation. First was the End of, the Japan, end of Japan's colonization of Korea in 1945, which is replaced by the Americans. The second was the end of the Cold War and the democratization of South Korea in the late 1980s, which enabled young Koreans to embrace foreign influences. And thirdly, the 1997 IMF crisis, which was characterized within Korea as a national humiliation and used as a springboard to launch the government-backed Korean wave. So broadly, it was the popularity of the Korean pop music and television soap operas, which can be traced back to 1997, that sparked this wave abroad. So after the Korean uh, War in 1953, the, as the South Korean government was trying to rehabilitate, rehabilitate the war-torn economy uh, with primary aid from US, they also started to build their diplomatic ties with Japan parallelly, which, uh, and with the coming of Japan, they started making huge investments in South Korea and um, opened the sector uh, to facilitate uh, capital investment and take advantage of the locally available cheap labor in Korea at that point of time. And by the 1970s, Japan actually became the second largest investor in Korea after the US, whose role 
even though it was primary at one point of time, gradually started to decline. Not only this, uh, uh, the, uh, there was the, uh, the impact of this IMF crisis had its effect on the Korean shipboards. So these are basically highly diversified conglomerates and corporations who were having a foothold and monopolizing every sector of the Korean economy. So uh, this Asian financial crisis not only forced them to restructure the existing business model, but also dispose certain business unit. And this opened the internal market for the from the monopoly of the shibals and many new small and independent entrepreneurs started to grow in various industries where they actually started taking advantage of technological investments. So having been dependent on a traditional manufacturing process ever since it rose out of poverty after the Korean War, this technological in um, innovations helped them in creating new industries and focus on building a superstructure of their cultural power. Along with that, uh, Korea had a censorship laws which was initially in place prohibiting movie makers from showcasing topics which were considered to be controversial. So after this ban was lifted in 1996, it allowed the creative independence of artists to flow. And this led way to a new young and vibrant generation of filmmakers, musicians, actors, and influencers who started growing during this phase. And it was at the turn of the 1990s that Korean industry started to export television dramas to other countries. This was also a paradigm shift for the country who had for a long time depended on automobile, chemical, construction, and electronic industries as sectors that they believed would lead to the progress of the country. Uh, so according to, uh, again, statistically, uh, according to a survey conducted by KTO, it was found that the total halio related to risk spend uh, almost makes up uh, in up to like 55.3% of their inbound tourism as per the uh, survey of 2019. Apart from this, uh, moving on from the government initiatives and the political part of it, uh, there were other factors which, uh, which activated uh, the growth of this wave. One was the role of the K fans and the supranational fandom that was built by all the fans of K culture. Second was their discourse of cultural essentialism which implies the self-confidence and the pride of the Korean people. And it comprises of two important elements. One was Koreanness, which is the confusion tradition and the discovery of traditions and filial piety. And second was Han, which symbolizes their aggressive and tenacious personality and the spirit to do everything you can to achieve the best results. So Helio was eventually seen as an attractive soft power uh, which can be summed up in a word, energy. And it was developed in four distinct phases. Phase one, which saw the major, which was influenced majorly by the K-dramas. Phase two, which saw the rise of K-pop music. Phase three, the learning of the language that is Hangul, Korean food that is Hansik, and traditional costumes that is the Hanbok. And fourth, and the last one is the rise of the K-style of publicity as presented to the life of the uh, Korean stars. So uh, finally, in, in Conclusion, I would like to say that tradition and technology have rightly blended together to present the Korean culture as a product of cultural hybridization and globalization by fusing the local and the global elements through appropriation and adjustments that generated a sense of curiosity towards this exotic Asian culture. It is also seen as a different phenomenon from um, cultural imperialism as its goal is not to establish a hegemonic imperialism of culture but to create a world wave that embraces and connects with different cultures presenting a global village. It was also seen as an alternative to the cultural globalization dominated by the US because South Korea wanted to use this opportunity of soft power in the cultural domain as a means to overcome their cultural marginality. And then uh, the cultural globalization, it, lies in the it does not lie in the power of dominance and imposition for them, but as a possibility of creation and interaction. However, um, so as uh, the US position itself as a symbol of progress and development after the second world war, it asserted its control through the hard power. However, today as it faces a serious challenge because the Asia Pacific region looks beyond the US as well in terms of increasing recognition of a cultural soft power. The pop culture of South Korea is just one example, but similar patterns can be observed emerging from the vitality of other East Asian cultures such as China, Japan, India, Hong Kong, exposing a new discourse to understand the change in power dynamics and beginning and start and starting to begin of a starting the beginning of a new dialogue in the Asian region. 
in, in conclusion, I would just like to say that even the critics argue that the Korean wave as is nothing unusual, but a product of a shallow capital culture. The wave also signifies a negotiated process of cultural consumption between consumers and a culture. So such processes allows consumers to invest their energy and emotion, which helps them to acquire pleasure, as well as meaning, such as the concept of love, relationship, traditions, and family values. And many theorists have also noted that these characters are very much present in the Korean television dramas in such a way that it presents the traditional values and the technological sophistication compared to uh, other American uh, movies. So this has led Korea to be regarded as a prominent model to emulate, emulate both economically and culturally. Also, as it is well known that Korea has uh, not been a traditional center of popular culture in Asia, but has emerged from uh, emerged to become a sub empire in its journey from a country that was sunk into conflicts and poverty to being liberalized. They always feared losing their cultural particularity due to the history of colonization. But however, they used the process of cultural hybridization where their local elements underwent the process of negotiation with the foreign elements and constructed their own cultural space, which found acceptance among countries and people today. Thank you. Thank you so much. May we now request Ms. Dekum Zhang to start her presentation. Mr. Uh, to start his presentation, please. And if there are any questions, uh, students may please put in the chat. And as Dr. Mohan has already answered the questions put in the chat, very kind of him. Thank you, Dr. Mohan. Uh, the rest of the presenters may also do the same. So maybe have the next presenter, please. Mr. Dickham Zheng, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly or not, but maybe have you, please. Uh, Ma'am, uh, I think uh, Mr. Dickham is not able to join. He's from Nepal. Uh, okay. He thinks some network issue at his end. He's trying. The moment he joins, then uh, we can have, so okay, we can okay, go to the next okay. uh, presentation. So, Miss Monica. Uh, Miss Monica. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And uh, I request to please start with your presentation. And there is one presenter we missed in between. So if she is there, she may also uh, do it next after you. Please start. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, I will switch off my video for my convenience and I will start sharing my PPT. Okay. May I request all to please put your questions in the chat box <clears throat> and they will be answered by the respective uh, presenters. Oh, can you see my uh, PPT, ma'am? Yes, we can see your PPT. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my topic is religion in China's periphery diplomacy. Uh, my PhD topic is uh, almost similar to it and it revolves around a couple of research questions. Uh, the three questions which I would be try, trying to cover here are uh, why do countries use religious diplomacy over linguistic diplomacy and which one maximizes the desired outcome as a soft power strategy and what are the tools that China uses in its uh, soft power strategy? To what extent is religion used in China's soft power promotion? How far has religion helped China concretize bilateral relations with its neighbors and uh, serve its strategic interests? Due to paucity of time, I have uh, tried to uh, you know, brief it down to what is China's periphery diplomacy and to what extent China, uh, religion plays a role, uh, but not uh, fully on Buddhism. What is the rationale behind China's new periphery diplomacy? So China's foreign policy was shaped by uh, leaders such as Mao Zedong, Shou Enlai, Deng Xiaoping, uh, Jiang Xiamen, and Hu Jintao. And as recently as President Xi will be le leaving a lasting legacy through his Belt and Road Initiative and the new periphery diplomacy, which they call it as Zobian, which was launched in October 2013. As China is partially accommodated in the global sphere as an emerging superpower, it is essential to address any possible suspicion in its uh, neighborhood, any possible suspicion of a perceived hegemony in its immediate neighborhood. So critics argue that China's actions are only inconsistent with its policy of communities of shared common disease. 
So softball becomes a precursor to China's rise as it underpins leadership over hegemony. As a cultural juggernaut, China did not confine itself to using political ideology as a soft power since its founding in 1978, sorry, since its opening of reforms in 1978. So it has gone through tectonic shifts in its foreign policy. And this paper is focused on the role of religion in China's periphery as part of its soft power tools and strategy. So what are the uh, soft power tools that China uses in its neighborhood? So, uh, first would be religion and culture, and then economic integration, tourism, as recently as vaccine diplomacy. So in religion and culture, the aim is to allay any perceived hegemony. Uh, they use a Buddha diplomacy. China organizes Buddhist councils and uh, sponsors a lot of uh, renovation and rebuilding of uh, ancient uh, sites, uh, he cultural heritage sites. And in economic integration uh, as a soft power tool, China aims to diffuse its norms, the Chinese norms, like the Washington cons consensus versus the Beijing consensus. So China uh, is using uh, economic integration uh, to leverage its uh, leadership role through regional, institutional, and economic assistance. Uh, the tools that China uses is uh, Belt and Road Initiative, Asian Invest uh, Investment Infrastructure Bank, and uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Okay, in China's periphery diplomacy at a glance, uh, what is it new since it's uh, three major policy from the Maoist uh, era? Hu Jintao government adopted a policy of Sandling, uh, which was a Maoist legacy, uh, Mao Zedong's legacy of three major policy towards its neighbors, which consists of Moonling, Anling, and Fuling, which is, you know, resolve issues amicably and secure your uh, borders and, uh, you know, seek prosperity in the neighborhood. The President Xi's government has laid out even more attention and emphasis on maintaining good relations with its land and maritime neighbors since 2013, uh, ever since he came to power. Uh, and he laid out as Zobian, and, it, and in this new type of uh, great power relations, uh, the, under, uh, the underlying principles are uh, Qing, Chang, Huei Rong, which is closeness, earnestness, and mutual benefit and inclusiveness. It was for the first time that China has compartmentalized. These are not my words. These were uh, words of the scholars. China has first time compartmentalized its uh, neighborhood into friends and foes. It aimed to secure its uh, national interests by gaining more global leadership, emphasizing bilateral relations, and using bilateral means to resolve bilateral issues, which actually is antithetic to what uh, what Piyush Goel uh, had been saying that the Chinese have been using uh, multilateralism, uh, but then they actually resort usually to bilateral, uh, you know, uh, bilateral uh, uh, settlements and bilateral problem solvings. So a salient feature of the periphery diplomacy is the emphasis and practice of religious diplomacy, which is for the first time in 2013 uh, was like, uh, in particular, like Buddhism as a soft power was launched. What is the aim of the periphery diplomacy? It is to establish a comprehensive sub-regional and regional cooperative security relations, deepen mutual benefits among its neighbors and solidify economic ties, maintain and use well the important strategic opportunities that are given to China and for the rise of China. And safeguard China's sovereignty, security and development interests, solid, uh, consolidate uh, good friendliness and good neighborliness and consolidate the neighbors and make them feel safe by integrating China's strategic opportunities with them, strive to make the political relations of peripheral countries with China even better, and deepen the cooperation and uh, uh, public diplomacy. End objective is to use alternate use uh, strategy, alternate strategies to achieve global leadership. This Foreign Minister Yang, uh, Yang Yi summed up as involving the search for a periphery environment of peace, stability, and common development. From this, usually the Chinese perspective is that uh, they are seeking to use uh, more less of power, like uh, more less of military engagement, but uh, through participation yeah. and soft power influence. Uh, yes, hi, Dr. Divya. Uh, ma'am, I just wanted to uh, first uh, thank you for your support. And secondly, ma'am, I have a workshop that starts at 11 o'clock. So can I leave the presentation because I have to attend that? Or should I wait a couple of more minutes till any questions come? Oh, sorry. Should I continue with the session now?
Yes, uh, Monica, sorry for the distance. Okay. Okay, so uh, from this, the Chinese usually uh, conclude that uh, they aim to use less of power and uh, military engagement in their uh, neighborhood and uh, more to use of participation and uh, use soft power to influence their neighborhood. At least that's their perception. And uh, so religion in China's periphery diplomacy, uh, coming to like, I have explained what is periphery diplomacy and what are some of the tools. And now in brief, I'll talk about religion in China's periphery diplomacy. As Indians, we are often uh, tend to, uh, lean towards culture and religious diplomacy. Although economic interdependence through cooperation and partnership could reduce friction and conflict between nations, it is only through culture or religious soft power strategies that a rising power can ensure the security of its small neighbors are not threatened. A significant shift in Beijing's foreign policy came with the new periphery diplomacy as it took solace in employing religious and cultural diplomacy across the foreign policy spectrum. China being an ancient civilizational state where Buddhism and Islam flourish religion is a potential factor driving its uh, foreign policy, especially BRI partners in Central Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia. Here, Buddhism played a vital role in bilateral relations with countries such as Japan, where as recently as President Xi during his state visit to Japan invoked a, a story of a Chinese monk visit to Japan centuries ago and the transmission of the Chinese Buddhism and Chinese culture into Japan. Religion has created a favorable external condition for China's foreign policy and promote peace, tranquility, stability, and joint development as put in their uh, community of shared dreams uh, policy. The salient element of the new periphery diplomacy was to explore the role of religion in China's neighborhood. And the emphasis lay on finding the common grounds and converging interest in its neighborhood uh, to achieve its national security interests. Since she came to power, China has embraced uh, religion as a pot uh, potential soft power to leverage its influence in its immediate neighborhood and its distant periphery and immediate periphery. China had to ensure its neighbors that they do not feel threatened by its overwhelming economic and military ambitions and might. So thus, you know, China had to use religion and cultural soft power and to allay any fears in, uh, with its uh, maritime uh, uh, neighbors and its uh, land, land neighbors. As uh, the UN, uh, UN dynasty in China, the political succession, uh, succession of Mongols marked the, you know, most of modern China's uh, boundary today. The Mongols could not have achieved this without integrating themselves into the religion of the areas they conquered, such as Islam to the Western frontiers and Buddhism and Lamaism in the central and southern frontiers of Sichuan and uh, Tibet. Uh, the early Mongols are revered as the most secular rulers, although they do have uh, some history of some radical fanatics as that of Aurangzeb. So, uh, they, but on an average, they are considered as most secular uh, rulers because they sought uh, more secular than even the Tang Dynasty. Uh, but they do have a tainted history of having persecuted Taoists. And uh, they, they sought to uh, take blessing of whosoever the god is, they didn't mind. They just sought to take the blessings of the uh, uh, subject, whosoever they conquered. So they always uh, integrated themselves to the populace and uh, for the well-being of themselves as the king and the rulers. And they never imposed their religion or faith on the subjects. So China today is more or less like that. Like uh, China actively engaging with the Taliban is a sign of its openness akin to the Mongols. It's just my you know, vague perception. And in a concluding remark, due, due to paucity of time, I would be, uh, you know, sh I would just end very shortly. Uh, for any further discussions on the topic, anyone can reach out to me. I would leave my email address in the end. Uh, China today is a secular state with the reminiscence of the Yuan dynasty characteristics. I wouldn't say Tang dynasty because which was uh, full on flourishing with the Buddhism. So uh, China uh, today is more secular. So I would uh, compare it to Yuan dynasty. And China sponsors World Buddhist uh, Sangha Council and World Fellowship of Buddhist Meat and repairing and renovating of ancient Buddhist sites, which as recently as uh, uh, 2018, she's visit to uh, Nepal and then later on uh, announcement of uh, funding to Pakistan and Afghanistan. It also nominates the heritage sites uh, along the ancient Silk Road corridor in Central Asia and South Asia for UNESCO accreditation, of which the, uh, India is also part of the nominating committee, which also includes uh, Iran. Now, in the words of uh, former ambassador to Kyrgyzstan, Peace Torban, an Indian diplomat, Obeyawar is a political geography of Buddhism. So you cannot negate or you know remove 
or neglect religion from China's foreign policy. Although religion is anti uh, antithetic to communism, religion and culture as soft power play a vital role in influencing other countries to adjust their policies favorably. The role of religion, in particular Buddhism in China's foreign policy decisions and soft power diplomacy in securing its national interest is not negligible. Buddhism has helped Beijing quantify the soft power influence in its immediate uh, periphery invariably. However, the emerging complexities in Indo-Pacific have challenged and have, uh, have challenges the, you know, the vitality of religion as a soft power in China's foreign policy. Uh, my end note is uh, Yang Xiaoping, a Chinese scholar, points out that China's strategic periphery foreshadows a danger of increased interaction, competition, and friction as we see today, even in Indo-Pacific. And uh, how will this overplay out? Oh, I'm sorry. The complexities in the region and will it in, uh, inevitably trigger major conflicts through increasing competition and potential destruction or escalation of uh, issues or will it uh, manageably come up with a new normal uh, and uh, somehow try to de-escalate or uh, reduce the conflict so how does china seek to balance this so this is a question which uh, uh, time would only answer and some scholars alluded that china's hanbal that is confucius institutes uh, are overwhelming, you know, overwhelmingly focusing on language or Mandarin teaching instead of the emphasis on uh, things that naturally drive people towards China, its culture and its religio-cultural factors like Tai Chi, Kung Fu, Buddhism, Taoism as a religion and as a philosophy of life. So if China's resorts to uh, overemphasizing uh, language or linguistic promotion, the linguistic diplomacy can potentially turn into linguistic imperialism. So to control China has a lot to benefit from religious diplomacy in its near periphery and an overwhelming emphasis on language can, or ideological partnership could only limit the scope of people to people interaction and cooperation. Thank you, Amity. And this is my uh, contact ID. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, organizers. Thank you, Ms. Monica, for a beautiful presentation and in enhancing our knowledge. So uh, we still have two presenters who were not able to present earlier. If they are present here right now, they may present their uh, research paper. Are they here? Mr. Dekham Zhang. So uh, as they are not here, both the other presenters who have missed, they're not here. So yeah, I just got a message, ma'am. Uh, uh, Mr. Dechin is not able to join because of his uh, network issue. He's not getting the net to get, he's coming for two minutes and then he's leaving. That's what his problem okay. is. Okay, so I, I think we need to skip him. Uh, we don't have any option. Right. And there was another uh, presenter who uh, couldn't the, join us. Uh, yeah, anyway. Devina Singh, again, yes. the same problem. Yes. Uh, she's okay. also not able to join. Fine, fine, fine. So um, uh, now as uh, there are no more presenters, may I request uh, Dr. Neeti Basin to give her concluding remarks? All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So... Um, First of all, my apologies that I joined in late, but apparently this was some communication gap which was left. So I was not really aware of this particular session happening. So since I was in the middle of a meeting, so I just had to, you know, sort of end it and then join. Uh, thanks anyways to, uh, to Amity, to Professor Naga Lakshmi, Professor Shalini, I can see on the screen. Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, well, I was not able to uh, hear out all the presentations, but whatever little I could make out. Yes, there was this interesting bit on the Korean, uh, you know, the concept of uh, localization and globalization and localization, as we call it, and how that culture has, you know, uh, spread over the world. And then the, the last paper I could see. So unfortunately, I couldn't hear the earlier presenters. Um, but uh, the theme indeed is very interesting when we say economic and uh, socio-cultural trends in Asia Pacific. I think I would be talking more on the uh, economic side because I, uh, you know, that's what I deal with more. So it's about trade and investment and how how things happen on the 
you know, uh, international or the global front. And uh, there are so many interesting insights to um, explore when we are examining international trade dynamics. And this whole thing has become particularly more interesting, uh, insightful after the, you know, the in the aftermath of the pandemic, as we say, and uh, how, <clears throat> I mean, more, uh, we, we are aware of more recently uh, things happening, uh, the Quad meet is, meet is underway. So let's see how the Quad decides to uh, deal with expansionist Chinese policies. Uh, very recently, I was also, uh, you know, reading about how China is also now applying for joining the CPTPP, which is the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. Now, that is going to be interesting because it's a very major free trade agreement uh, between 11 Asia-Pacific countries. And uh, it has been functional since 2018. Uh, we have major countries like Japan, Canada, Australia, who are among the large economies of the group. Uh, if China gets its way, it means uh, what it is actually saying is that it is going to allow China to engage in business as usual with these countries, no matter how bad the political realities can get. It, it can you know, score its decisive political goals through this, uh, through entering into a deeper and more comprehensive foreign trade agreement. Now, so, uh, you know, I, I don't know about the audience here, but normally when I talk about trade and investment in my class, I say there is, there is quite a gap between what the theory tells us and what the reality is. So when we talk of economics, trade dynamics, investment dynamics, they do not always work according to theories. And there are um, geopolitical realities, cultural dimensions, as we just saw in one paper, religious diplomacy, as I saw in the last paper. These are all dimensions which impact economic and you know other uh, trade dynamics among countries so there is there is so much and there is a lot to learn from this if i talk of india of course we are uh, you know perennially checking china for all its expansionary policies that it keeps uh, you know uh, that keep happening so the more recent one being again since since my field is investment so i closely watch the fdi policy of india and I'm sure many of you would be um, aware that, that last year we revised our FDI policy to screen proposals for FDI, which were coming from neighboring countries, the primary uh, target being China. Now that was, that was very interesting to observe because the theory tells us that we should attract FDI into a developing country like India because we always face a gap between the desired level of investment and the actual level of investment. So let it come in through, to, through FDI, but it should not be, I mean, we cannot take things on their face value. So what we observed during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic was, since economic activity slowed down in India, there were a lot of firms which were up for sale at very low prices. And so what was observed was that a lot of Chinese firms were trying to go for predatory acquisitions in India, which practically meant that a lot of unicorns that we boast about in our startup ecosystem would have a very significant Chinese stake in them. So acknowledging that there was this change in FDI policy that was brought about. Well, again, I mean, the, the dynamics are huge. There are There is so much to keep learning all the time. Uh, for those of you who are engaged in this, I think the most recent one would be to look into the Quad Summit that's happening and, you know, what we get out of all of that. But, uh, but that, that would be it from my side. I mean, I can just go on because this is an area of my interest. But my best wishes to all the presenters, all the participants here, I'm sure 
um they have all uh, you know they are doing great work and they have taken up wonderful topics the last two only i could see and i'm sure the earlier ones would have done a great job as well so my best wishes to all of you and uh, keep learning thank you very much yeah thank you dr niti vashan it was a uh, very nice and thought invoking concluding yes uh, we are seeing a lot of uh, chinese aggression especially increasing i also foresee something type of a cooperation uh, leading uh, with the black uh, with the thrashing going on with the china and all the rest of the countries grouping together you know coming out with an economic forum and free trade etc but leaving apart china looking at the black uh, backlash towards china is what is going on and it does uh, give me lots of thought you know towards doing a lot of research in this area now especially right. when japan and china had such a huge uh, uh, international trade with them and this going down and mm-hmm. then japan making it more towards taiwan now you know lots of yeah. things going on and lots of yes let's see what the quadra tells us tomorrow as lots of again uh, supply chains are going to be made tomorrow some agreements on supply chains tomorrow would be coming out so we do see lots of economic as well as political cooperation going on right. so i always you know tell in my class that politics is all based the base is always economics so it is on that economic base that we always have the political thoughts and the political yeah, absolutely. other exactly. and i guess and i also so think both, you know there's both. a lot of scope for people to look into the opportunities which both. are there for india i'm arising post both you know political and political and economic both are interlinked we just cannot separate Uh, yes sir perfectly yes. true yes, that yes, is yes, what yes. we used to study even our in our political economy and as we grew we yes. learned that there's so much interaction between the two you know politics yes. and economics you cannot separate uh, yes. actually i am a bit surprised everyone is scared about the chinese uh, rise and everything politically and strategically if the forces have cooperation political forces they can just uh, cap china in every aspect but the situation is altogether different there is no cooperation is a us hegemony then there are so many other issues involved and though, uh, there are so many you can say ke ups and down and the uh, when i was just hearing all the papers and uh, to add some of the papers were just out of uh, track here what means ke just i understand ke all are such scholars but i request all the research scholars and the presenters please uh, take the advice of your guide or mentors show the your presentation to them and talk to them uh, this is my observation and suggestion to all the, those uh, their attempts i really appreciate but with reservations i am sorry to say that they may be annoyed with me but being a you can say a, a senior person i think i have the right to say and uh, i also feel uh, that you know uh, economics being the base politics revolving around it and religion also revolving around it you know there's so much coercion coming in and so much going on so lots of things to learn now and lots of economic uh, regionalism going on let's see you know i i don't know i'm quite uh, enthusiastic to see if everybody gets together then there is going to be a perfect uh, backlash towards china but yes china has such a huge stake in every country it's going to be a very difficult task so you know i uh, uh, yeah professor yes. shalini just just one little comment for all the presenters although i didn't mm-hmm. look at all the papers just the two of them i saw i i really uh, didn't see much literature quoted by people uh, you know so uh, for all uh, and for the previous presenters i don't know what the presentations were but but there is a, a serious need to talk about existing literature on this subject so whether you pick up religious diplomacy or whether you pick up you know anything else localization it's it's really important for anyone who is undertaking a research paper to cite uh, pertinent literature on on that subject and then uh, point out the gap that you are trying to address through your paper so Sally, i i guess uh, that that uh, adds I, I, i am to add one small observation 
there is no globalization now it's globalization the term the globalization is over it's nice globalization every dimension have been changed drastically and uh, we should not use like alu globalization everywhere it's a trend it should be changed and revised thank you so much right dr neeti you are very well said that we really need to the uh, they need to look into the problem investigate the problem as to how others have approached it finalize your topic accordingly then finalize your uh, objectives and then come out with your hypothesis and presentation analysis so yes very true so a uh, review of literature is one of the most pertinent parts mm -hmm. of a research paper you cannot go away from it mm -hmm. so so you that's some questions it. here uh, in the chat box okay and in question answer uh, also there are some questions but the thing is ma'am this is not our research proposal this is our presentation so if it was to be a research proposal perhaps we would bring the literature gap and we would discuss more about it And no, site. no, no. I'm so sorry. A research paper is also to be uh, mon, looked mon, at it from mon, this mon, point of view. I, I agree with uh, Basin. A review of literature is an integral and important part. And generally, the researchers they are wholly dependent on Google Baba. Google Baba is their uh, god. At sube namaskar karte hain, sabhi wahin se lete hain. Isiliye ye problem khadi hui hai. Review of literature is extremely important. I have. Forty um, eight uh, years of research and teaching experience, I have realized <laughs> the present generation they they are just involved in copy and paste, nothing else. उनको कुछ नहीं जैसे तो किताब पढ़ने में और कोई research article में they have no dilatory. Thank you so much. So we'll request all the researchers to please look into the review of literature very rigorously. Whether you are writing a research paper or a research proposal, both ways it is required. Uh, there we have we do have a question. I am uh, reading it out, and I will like uh, one of the presenters to maybe uh, answer it. And uh, the question is: China's string of pearls. project and belt and road initiative poses a great threat to india how india is dealing with it what is india's strategy would anybody like to answer this maybe uh, dr mano mohan dr mohan would you like to attempt it because you're from the army background i thought maybe you would like to attempt you are not get <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I asked you. Sir, it is there in the question and answer Q okay. and A. So maybe you can just look into it. Okay. Uh, uh, basically, I am not much aware about the project and not gone in detail of the things. But one question which came in my mind while we are discussing, I have opportunity to. Uh, share my view with such learned uh, faculty members here uh, that uh, every time that is a part of the question every time we find china aggression and china chinese progression in that sense uh, is a threat for india so uh, in terms of trade in terms of the uh, like uh, just i have gone through these uh, papers uh, uh, means uh, regional then linguistic and all the things so whenever china is doing something we are very alert and would be defensive and try to be offensive also to it but we can also think alternatively how we can make our ourselves stand then how can we uh, be able in our in a position to counter that not to counter but just to have the self reliant and a good uh, nation a, a strong economy and all these things so basically uh, we should not think much uh, as a kind of threat to india for any kind of chinese project but of course we have and that i am not not my actually i am from this background but not i have access to these things so strategically they are taking care of all the thing happening along the borders and uh, we have the plans of all the thing we have to trust on the board thank you uh, thank you very much dr mohan uh, i think with that we can end our session dr nagalakshmi and we are right on time on time uh, i think there are some more questions in the chat box uh, okay there's somebody who wants to ask uh, okay just ask uh, 
Divya to just look into these questions. It needs yes. to be answered. Yes, Divya. Yeah. Uh, the question is: uh, Is CPEC becoming another East India Company? This is from Kazama Singh. So the question he has posted is for uh, Miss Monica: uh, Is CPEC? becoming another East India company. So the question itself seems to be incomplete. So Mon uh, Miss Monica, you want to try? I think uh, Miss Monica, I'm not able to see her. So sorry, uh, Mr. Kazama, Miss Monica is not here right now. So is there any other question anyone wants to ask? There's one question uh, from Nitish Pandey. He's a student from AIIS. Um, we have seen in last few years, so many Chinese banking system has clashed. More than two lakh companies went bankrupt and recently one of the biggest China's infrastructure companies is unable to pay. $300 billion of loan. Do you believe that world is going to face economic depression in the upcoming time due to China? So it's open to the uh, presenters if anyone would like to answer this. Uh, well, uh, let me just try it. Though I haven't done much research on this area, uh, but I still feel that economic depression uh, would not entirely come from China if this is happening, though there is a huge stake of the whole world in China, but that doesn't mean uh, that we will face a depression, economic depression due to China. And Corona has uh, one more thing that it has taught us, especially for India, that we do have a V-shape or a W-shape uh, recovery curves. So, you know, uh, the population of a country is basically dominating the production and again, the consumption of that country. So uh, saying this, that uh, China, because of the China, the depression would come. I, I, I wouldn't fully agree to this statement, but yes, there would be some, uh, some slowdown that might uh, come in because uh, there is a huge stake of countries in China as of now. Yeah, I, I would just like to add maybe to that and also to, to the to, so one initial question about the BRI or the OBOR, which uh, the Belt Road Initiative. So India's position, I guess someone was talking about, uh, well, India is pretty much clear about the OBOR or the BRI initiative. We have refused to be a part of this mm -hmm. and that has been acknowledged at the SCO meet recently. And uh, as far as the CPEC uh, is concerned, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, mm -hmm. India has always maintained that it runs uh, through uh, the Pakistan-occupied Jammu and Kashmir, and therefore it is uh, violative of our uh, territorial integrity and sovereignty. So India's stand is quite clear on that. We also moved out of the RCEP precisely because of this, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. India moved out of it because we understand that in the, in the present scenario, the benefits for India do not match the costs. So if India would have become a part of the RCEP, in that case, we would have lost out much more in terms of concessions than what we would have gained from the other countries. So... So we have taken almost a definitive stand on that. And um, well, as far as China's role, yes, there are companies going bankrupt in China. And yes, China is a very integral part of the global supply chain, but it's not integral to the extent that it would um, uh, cause a global recession because companies have already started repositioning themselves. Global supply chains have already started getting realigned in the wake of this. And therefore, uh, uh, you know, a, a global uh, impact of companies going bankrupt in China is unlikely. And, and, and we, we have a couple of policies to support that. India itself, I mean, there are a number of steps we have taken on the trade front as far as our uh, imports from China are concerned. We have revised our FDI policy as well. We have, I mean, uh, you, 
uh, uh, you can have a look at the recent schemes which have been announced by the government, including the PLI schemes for various sectors, where the primary objective of the government is to substitute China as a raw material provider in certain sectors, for example, pharmaceuticals. So I guess yeah, we, we are already working in that direction and we are pretty much definitive in our opinion and, and our stand as far as some of these agreements are concerned. Right, and uh, not only India, but this is happening throughout the world because yeah. everybody is feeling the backlash uh, which we are giving towards China. Everybody is in the same boat, you know. It's, it's like a segregation coming over and the whole world is coming together. That yes, this is uh, the reality. And uh, even the Quadra uh, meeting, which is going to be held tomorrow, it is also they're going to look into the supply chains, especially the backward supply chains, due to which a lot of manufacturing, especially in the car sectors, the four wheelers is being interrupted. So, you know, a lot of things are taking place and a lot of discussions are taking place. So uh, I don't think, and we are all preparing for the same thing that that should not happen to us. So I don't think that should economically be a problem, but yes, politically, uh, yes, China is becoming aggressive, no doubt. Yes, so I, uh, any more questions? Um, uh, I think we cannot take more questions now. Right, perfect. We are already uh, exceeding the time. So, um, thank yeah. you so much, Professor Shalini, ma'am, for chairing the session and providing us all with your valuable insights, specifically highlighting the economic dimensions of the Asia Pacific region and the power dynamics and the role of China, how um, China is playing an important role um, in the region. Extending my thanks to the co-chair, uh, Dr. Niti um, Uh Thank you so much, ma'am, for highlighting the gap between the theory and practice as to how uh, the different dimensions, for example, geo geopolitics, religion, cultural aspects impact the economy. So no, last but not the least, I would also like to thank all the presenters for sharing their perspective on the economic and the social cultural trends in the Asia Pacific region. All the best, thank you. Over to you, Roshni, for the... Uh, formal thanks once again. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you to the chair and the presenters for an enlightening session that has enabled us, especially the students of AIIS, with a greater understanding on economic and socio-cultural trends of the Asia Pacific. Thank you very much once again. We will now move on to the third technical session of the e-conference and I hand it over to Ms. Akriti Varma.